that triathlon show for a night. Hey, what's up everybody and welcome back to another episode of that triathlon show. The podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host Michael and on today's episode I interview Joel Filial. For those of you who don't know Joel, he's a very experienced and successful coach in the world of triathlon and especially in short course triathlon. Uh, he's currently coaching athletes like Katie Sefiris, Vincent Louis and Vasco Vilasa in his international squad. And in the past, he's uh, also coached athletes like Mario Mola, Richard Murray and um, many others at the absolute highest level of triathlon. Uh, for those of you who might be newer to uh, this podcast, I first interviewed Joel uh, back in 2019 in episode 172, which I'll, of course, link to in the show notes. And that episode is still very well worth a listen, as we pretty much spend about 90 minutes talking about Joel's training philosophy and how he structures the training of, of the athletes in his squad and uh, training-related questions, put simply. Also, more recently, we had uh, Vasco Vilasa, who is a current member of the squad, uh, in episode 401, and he explained in great detail uh, their training, going through a typical training week and so on. So I'll link to that episode as well. Uh, but as we have covered the topic about training in depth, both recently and uh, and back in 2019, in this interview, we go down a few different directions. So yeah, I just want to mention that in case you haven't listened to any of the this episode and wondering why we're seemingly brushing over some of those questions that i would normally ask that is because we have already covered them in in the past so it, it is there go and check those out and uh, uh, now enjoy this one with uh, joel filial before that though big thanks to our sponsors precision fuel and hydration uh, they help athletes perform at their best with electrolyte and fueling products and with free online tools education and a patented sweat test Big news from the Ironman World Championship weekend in Nice is that Precision Fuel and Hydration have launched a new flow gel. This is a gel designed so that you no longer have to squeeze 8 to 10 gels into a bottle for your races. The flow gel will help you get 300 grams of carbohydrate from one bottle or flask. And that gel flows easily without adding any water. So it is the perfect gel for the bike leg of a half or full distance triathlon. And uh, you can get 15% off your first Precision Fuel and Hydration order, including any other product. Products, not just the flow gel by using the code tts23 on precisionfuelandhydration.com and thank you to senate the senate indoor swim trainer allows you to improve your technique power and swim training consistency even when you're short on time it's a great tool for busy athletes because you can do a quality workout in just 15 minutes at home even on days when you don't have time to get to the pool uh, so it's a perfect complement to your pool and open water swimming it allows you to focus specifically on key aspects of your swimming like your catch and power and you can isolate these aspects aspects more easily than you can in the water uh, you can try the senate risk free for up to 30 days so if you don't love it just send it back and you can get 20 percent off your first order on senatesintro.com forward slash tts now without any further ado here's my interview with joel filial welcome back to that triathlon show joel it's been a while how are you doing <laughs> great thanks for having me back Let's uh, start with an introduction in case there are some uh, listeners that don't know who you are. Can you tell us more about yourself? Yeah, I, I started coaching in Canada in uh, around 2000, um, just just uh, right around the time that uh, Simon Whitfield was the, the first gold medal in, in the Sydney Olympics. Um, I actually started with uh, an online coaching uh, enterprise, which maybe wasn't a thing then, but uh, but if that was my start. But I was fortunate to get invited out to Victoria, British Columbia, after Simon uh, had, had won the gold and, and, and as an apprentice coach. So that was, that was my start of, of real coaching. And uh, that was, yeah, 2001 to 2008. I, I coached in Canada and in Victoria, uh, different roles. Um, ultimately, was the the national and Olympic coach for the Beijing Olympics, where where Simon won um, uh, a second uh, Olympic medal and it was silver in a great sprint against uh, Ferdano and uh, Bever Doherty. So very very timely for watching uh, maybe Ferdano's um, uh, fi final race. Uh, well, coming up soon as we record, but. Uh, but yeah, so then from there, um, I went over to the UK. I worked with British Triathlon for, for a couple of years. And then really after the London Olympics, I started my own squad. Um, 
JFT crew, as as named uh, maybe by Tommy Saferis, might have come up with this name, uh, and that persists until now. Um, we've been fortunate to have uh, quite a lot of different athletes of uh, great success. Um, uh, maybe the the first, I mean, Tom, Tommy is still still around, um, but um, but Mario Mola and Richard Murray joined early on, and, and we had many others through. Um, the Rio Games uh, and, and ultimately through to Tokyo. Uh, in the in the, in that period, I also worked uh, for Italy uh, for, as the Olympic Performance Director uh, for the four years. Uh, finally, ended up in, in Australia for two years. Uh, and all along this time, um, we kept the squad going uh, through support. Um, a former athlete Drew Box, uh, who who I coached for a few years. Has also come on as sort of a partner in the squad and has kept that going when when I've been in in different venues and doing different different types of work, and now based back in Europe and really building into the Paris Olympic Games next year. Yeah, it's been quite quite the journey. And um, for the listeners that haven't listened to your first interview on on this podcast, it was back in uh, early 2019. I want to say March or some something along those lines. So that would have been um, yeah in the lead up to Tokyo, which was then delayed. Uh, so so it was still quite quite some time out in in reality. But I guess one thing that I want to start talking about is, in your view, how has the sport and the demands of the sport developed and maybe changed since since that time and uh, since even the Olympic cycles uh, like Rio and London. Uh, what what are your thoughts on that? Mm. I mean, th- part of it is is the evolution of the sport, and then part of it when I when I was thinking about this is also what is the course and the demands. I mean, when Rio we had uh, an interesting bike course with quite a steep hill that influenced the race. Uh, London, maybe less so, but there was still a breakaway. Um, Tokyo, there was there was different types of races, and we've just finished the Paris test event as well. So how it's evolved, I suppose, in, in a big sense, uh, has been the demands of the bike, uh, for sure, have changed over time from sort of the, the original draft legal races, which maybe were um, not too many laps, mostly flat, not too technical, uh, to you know, we've had some courses that have been, have have had many many corners, so it's much more stochastic racing. Um, the ability to recover from repeated sprint efforts, uh, and also the technical skills required to both ride uh, efficiently, so you can still run reasonably, but also just the demands technically uh, to to get round in good position have also evolved. Um, so that that's been that's been a, over the course of you know a decade or more where that the 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 type of the course has has had a big influence. Um, of course, we see the 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 trend of faster running. I suppose uh, you can't can't ignore that. And uh, and and every, anytime I talk about running, you have to mention the the impact of of the carbon plate shoes on on running performance. Um, I think often uh, we tend to sort of gloss over that when we're talking about run times and, and you know splits, but of course it has a significant impact uh, in triathlon. Uh, we're running fatigued already, you know, pre-fatigued from the swim and bike, and um, and and also they, I think they tend not to uh, have the same impact on everyone. So that's also been having a, an interesting uh, dynamic, which you know, may, may talk a, lo- uh, a bit further along. But but in general, more technical bikes, the, ha- the demand is higher. It's not usually sort of that wet run um, that, that sometimes was the, the stereotype of, of some of the early draft legal races. And, um, and, and certainly the, the level of running and the density of the racing uh, has been ever increasing uh, across time. Uh, I think there's also an interesting dynamic of who the key players are in in men's and women's, and and whether we, you know at the moment you might say um, the men's racing has f- seen fewer breakaways, for example, or fewer fewer packs staying away. Uh, certainly, we saw that at the test event. Uh, the women's racing had been trending to towards um small group breakaways sort of again that that there's been various eras where that's been the case um but but certainly through t- 
Tokyo Games. We saw that. We saw a breakaway in, in Tokyo and a, and a small group coming from that. And that's been the thought, you know, um, since since the, you know the demands of the women's swim is is very high, uh, technical demands very high, and um, perhaps not the fastest runners. You don't necessarily need to have the fastest split, but but certainly we do see a number of the breakaway groups. So there, there's a number of points there, but it, but it certainly has evolved, and the demands have evolved, and I think probably in particular since. Um, we had this COVID break. I mean, it's very interesting to, to think about it. When that break occurred, um, did I think it had a significant impact on on what we saw in Tokyo and even even since. Uh, there were some young athletes that missed uh, one or two years of key development who are who have since been playing catch up. There's others that that break occurred at. Um, you know, maybe the pinnacle of their career and then the ultimate Tokyo Games was a step too long, um, you know, for, for some. And others, you know, hit the timing exactly. You know, you might look at uh, an Alex Yee or a Hayden who who the, the timing of, of 2021 saw their ascendance to, to um, the top of the sport. So, uh, so qu- quite, quite a range of, of thoughts as I reflect, where is the sport going next? What impact does it have on, on, our, on our coaching and programming, on training? Uh, I think you know, the mindset of these things are constantly evolving, so we, we ought not to be complacent with what we think it takes to win. Yeah, that's a good summary. One one follow up on uh, the men's racing and the uh, generally large packs that we tend to see now uh, would be that would you still say that I mean a criticism that is leveled at short course racing and men's racing in particular is that it's it's boring because the bike doesn't matter. But I, I think that it it probably isn't like that. It's it's just that everybody is so strong and so technically good on the on the bike so it really does take a lot out of them and uh, and causes that pre-fatigue so it's not just a wet run like it has been called before is is that a true reflection would you say or what's your thought on that yeah i mean we saw at the abu dhabi grand final last year uh, in the men's race uh, a break staying away and and ultimately we saw leo berger take the world title in a in part because because of that um uh, but stay away for a good part of the race. So, so, I mean, it's not for lack of effort, but it, but there are different dynamics. And I was thinking about this the the other day that you know, as the as the for example, the individual dynamics as the French men have got better and better individually, um, the the ability to work as a as a team, which which has been sort of speculated in the past, it actually gets harder. Much like the the Spanish men at their pinnacle of of. Javi, Mario, Fernando, they're, when they're all so good, it's hard to have a strategy uh, that isn't just three individuals racing. So, you know, maybe we saw some of that at the test event. I mean, the, the test event, we have to say, has an internal dynamic that that doesn't exist at many races because athletes are racing for whatever the selection standard is and maybe aren't willing to risk as much. But, um I mean, it, I, I think, you know, the, the packs and the way that it, it, the sport has evolved, I mean, it, everyone knows, you know, we need to swim faster. So people invest more in, in that. The gaps become smaller. Uh, and that's part of the evolution is that the, the smaller differences still matter, but um, but it becomes more and more competitive. I think it's a sign of competitiveness more than anything. Yeah, yeah. And has there been any impact, would you say, of uh, the introduction of the mixed team relay and also things like there are more sprint distance races on the uh, WTCS uh, circuit and and I guess the World Triathlon circuit in general? Super League has come along. That was around already in 2018, but it's become more established. uh, and, and, And on the flip side of that, there are also... I guess more opportunities for athletes to cross over into middle distance racing. So, uh, has that had an impact? For for sure. I mean, the 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 introduction of the mixed relay as an Olympic event and as as an event that can drive investment and funding has has had an impact. Um, I mean, it, there's there's a constant sort of pu- push and pull over. How, how do athletes whether they want to prioritize the relay or or which relays um because o- often it's it's tagged on to a world series um you know we there's kind of the issue that i've always ref- wrestled with is you know what's the impact of racing the next day on the athlete's health on, on their um you know injury business and some athletes that's that's a risk that's something we've had to 
had to deal with, um, in particular around um, when it's a standard distance and then a relay. I think it's an evolving space in how we understand what the demands of the relay are going to be. And I see, I think certainly there was a early on a thought, are we going to see specialists for the relay? And um, I think as long as both athletes have to race both or all the distances, it's really what we see they have to race uh, now, super sprint, eliminator, a relay, standard distance, sprint distance, it's all the same athletes. So I think that does limit the uh, p- possibility of specialization that, that we might see. Um, but but that, that was, I think, some, it has had some impact on how it's thought that we should train if, in terms of specializing for the relay. And I guess where, where I sort of land on that is it's, uh, this is, you know, it's an aerobic sport. It's not that much different. 20 minutes is not substantially different to 60 minutes to two hours. It's basically, it's all aerobic and, and we race it in a very similar way. Um, so I've found athletes been able to race up distance or down distance um, with the methodology we use in any case. Um, not too difficult. Uh, not everyone has probably arrived at, at that conclusion. I think there's a fair amount who who believe that maybe there is more opportunity in specialization of the short distances. But yeah, so where I've landed on that is is much more about uh, you know general aerobic endurance and conditioning. We can ra- you know we can race up or down in distance uh, fa- fairly well. And um, so any of the athletes that have had racing relays or super league we we haven't felt a, a need necessarily to prepare specifically for those distances uh and again that name is part of the i suppose the periodization is um you know which are the priorities of the year and the individual often comes first um, i mean the, a relay medal is still significant but i think there's still a part of the sport where it's an individual sport by nature and, and athletes want to target the individual event as their own priority so it's an it has been an evolving space i think and it does give probably the, the national sports the, the federations a little bit more power in the in the dynamic which some may be happy about some less happy about uh, of course, to put together teams and, and sort of that, you know, how, how do you evaluate mixed relay performance given there are so few standalone super sprint races that athletes race head to head? We generally only see, well, not even the not even the world champs this year, but we didn't have the French team racing the, the world champs for relay in Hamburg. So, you know, ability to measure head to head has also been, uh, you know, difficult to ha- you know how do you how do you pick your team and well, i mean where where i've sort of landed at the, in that is that the best individuals are typically the best for the relay so the best individual performances are typically the best for the relay and the the, the stat that always gets th- thrown around in that space is um that 11 of the 12 um, uh, athletes who form part of the medal winning relay teams in Tokyo had won an individual World Series medal in the previous quad. So, but the only exception uh, being Kevin McDowell from the US, who was also sixth in the individual race in, in Tokyo. So, it certainly seems that it's converged on very good individual racing. Those are going to be your best teams. Beyond sort of the best teams, there, there are going to be some differences. Athletes who are younger in their development haven't yet matured to the point to be able to race a standard distance to their full potential we might see them appear to be better over a 20 minute race relatively but that might be just a long-term sort of conditioning issue so it, it has had an impact for sure and uh, i mean we we'll probably continue to talk about the, the the middle distance racing um further along but but that's also in play as we watch you know the agreement with the uh, world triathlon and pto and where's that going to go yeah no that that all makes makes sense and even though the the main philosophy of of just building that aerobic foundation i guess hasn't changed are there any other things in your coaching like smaller details or things that you can think of that that have changed for the uh to basically meet the the changing demands or just as a natural development of your own coaching Hmm. Yeah, I think cer- certainly o- over time we've we've had to prioritize the technical element more more so, you know, and especially these these short distance races that are often held over very short and tight courses. Um 
I was watching the the Super Leagues the last couple of weeks in in Toulouse and in London, and you see, you know, the the bike course is a K or less than a K, so inevitably it's got a, a high technical demand. So so this this always comes into play, and it's you know it's the the infinite game of um, bike technical skills and confidence and ability to apply power. So, you know, particularly we, we get athletes who don't necessarily have that background and, and have to, to learn how to apply that. So, so that, that's something that's been ever present and increasing. Uh, and, the, and there's the balance between um, preparing for specific courses versus the season long narrative. Uh, and again, you might, you might come back to the test event uh, that we saw in Paris as um not too technical uh, for for example what type of preparation uh, might that um uh, elicit as a result of knowing that and you know but but still in triathlon you you've got to have different tools to be successful you you've got to be able to be strong enough on the bike that if it does end up being a, a demanding bike even if the course didn't dictate that that you can deal with that and run well so you know you, you really do need to have all of those pieces in place in any case if you're going to be successful yeah um and uh yeah so as you mentioned you you have been with triathlon australia but now uh, you're back with the squad so so i guess that was a scenario where you had to work you mentioned drew being present with the squad but but you had to work remotely so can you talk about what that experience was like for you and how how you managed that yeah it cer- certainly helps if you've got somebody on the ground like like drew that um, had developed as an athlete uh, and 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 then be being on the ground and being the eyes and ears but i have to say it's not it's not easy um you know i suppose in triathlon we do have the the, the tradition and history, if we can call it that, of of remote coaching has, has been a thing. You know, it's maybe a sport where where triathlon was was an early mover, as as I said before, with my own background. But it certainly created some challenges. You know, and and having been here on the ground for the last couple of months, those you know, just observing body language, observing um, uh, the informal communication that you can have before and after a session, just just even just watching how the work is done and getting that that sense of where the athlete's recovery is at and how close we can sort of walk the line of recovery, absorption and adaptation. Um, it's harder to do <laughs> remotely, absolutely. And I mean, I also felt myself like, you know, the further you away you get away from the little the decision making i feel like on the ground those you know those tools can can become dulled a little bit so i think i i've uh, appreciated that uh, even even more so but but that said um you know i think we were able to deliver uh, coaching to a very high level through how drew and i work together in any case but but i do it, it is a optimal uh, way of working seeing the athletes even if that that's not always possible that but that i think in order to maximize performance that that certainly helps and, and when we've had athletes who for a variety of reasons have been uh remote um whether that was during during covid or even even since for for different reasons if the calendar doesn't align certainly it challenges communication it challenges um being able to make those adjustments that on the day could be the difference between, you know, uh, having having a, a niggle turn into an injury, or or even just getting the the training load right. Um, you know, how many times we end up adapting based on what we see from from being there on the ground. So I, I do think it's a su- superior model, even if it's not always possible. Uh, to do so, it, it did highlight the last couple of years that those challenges and. Um, you know, it does force you to refine what that process is and to distill what are the essentials that we need to know when, when an athlete is not, not with us and in, in front of us. Uh, but I do uh, appreciate uh, seeing and feeling with my own eyes and hearing <laughs> with my own ears what, what's going on and how the athletes are going. So if, if you can pick one or two things that you, you when you just said that it reinforces what you need to know from the athlete when you're not there, what would and let's say you have to go away for six months now again or for some reason what what are a couple of learnings that you would take okay these are the things that i will need to try to get mm. on top of even as i'm remote 
It's hard to replace the just just speaking verbally uh, and hearing, you know, even just tone, mood. Um, so I think having, ha you know, well, well, it's very easy to sort of fall into a, a text-based communication style. We miss that sort of context. So I think, um, I mean, that's something maybe a lot of people started to do a bit more in the pandemic. But I did feel feel that. Uh, there's this added context there. So I think just more, more voice communication. And I suppose young, young people these days like to send me uh, voice messages. So, so I think that that's been a, a handy thing as well. Um, but I think also, you know, if, if we're talking about, you know, what's the benefit, what's the sort of the risk when, when, when we're not able to see an in prison uh, in terms of the training load, I think leaving a, a buffer, uh, so I have to remind myself a buffer towards what I think that they could do, dialing things back a little bit such that, um, you know, if things do sort of go wrong and, you know, they're a little bit more fatigued than we anticipated, um, that we're not kind of too close to the limit of what of what might cause a problem down the road. And, and th I mean, that that's what's what's likely to go wrong uh, is um, when when we've not got timely enough or quick enough communication about a physical issue. So, uh, you know, uh, a niggle, a pain, a tightness, that kind of stuff we want to be uh, on, on top of as soon as possible, even if we don't end up changing something in the moment. But, you know, you still register that and you think, okay, when I'm you know, writing the next run session, maybe I'm going to build a bit more buffer than I might have or, or write in the comments or communicate in advance that um, – a couple of different options to help help guide that process. So if they're out, you know, doing a run session themselves, for example, and they thought, okay, if if, if it's not feeling how I want, I'm going to do this plan B instead of um, just try to proceed through or to to bail completely to have some different different um, alternatives. So so I think having that sort of workload buffer. Um, I mean, the better you know the athlete, the more you can be precise about what that might look like, but. Inevitably, yeah, I do want to avoid um, overestimating what the athlete might be able to do when I'm not present, and I don't get that immediate sort of feedback. When you go, "Oh, yeah, I can, I can see and feel this is this is probably too close to the limit," so I'll dial that back. And I have found in the past tending towards the the training load or the training program being slightly too aggressive. You know, if I've not thought about that, so it's a good reminder for myself um, to to just just leave enough space for for the the uh, variations that inevitably athletes will go through in a given training week or training cycle. And uh, moving to the topic of the Olympics, uh, how how does that how do you think about the periodization this year was a special year with the test event taking a center stage i guess and and then next year obviously with the olympics uh coming up how are these years these seasons different than a than another season than last season uh considering these main events in terms of perhaps training but uh, per perhaps more importantly racing and periodization of, of what races to do Hmm. It, it is uh, interesting in a couple of points that um, having a shorter Olympic cycle, uh, just just three years since Tokyo, has sort of removed that building back year um, that, that we normally get. Um, that, that on reflection, I feel is actually pretty pretty important in that Olympic cycle. You know, it gives gives an athlete a break, uh, just time to decide if they're going to change, you know, focus whether they go along or not. Um, and even just that rebuilding. So it wasn't too long after Tokyo before the new qualification period started, of course, because in uh, Olympic triathlon, it's two, it lasts two years. So we're already into the second year uh, of the Olympic uh, qualification. And of course, for the, for the top athletes, the, the ranking isn't the primary driver necessarily, but it does, it has an impact on, on the whole process. So, with regards to the next 12 months and coming off the test event, I mean, one, one of the interesting things about the test event, of course, is it's it's not a great test that it's not the same date um, in the calendar. So the Olympics in Paris next year is at the end of July, right at the end. Um, so so that doesn't ha make, make an impact in which should be your last races before the Games. It's always a, an interesting dialogue to have. Uh, this year we had... Um, the Sunderland World Series about two weeks before the the, the 
the test event or maybe it was about three weeks uh, and Hamburg two weeks before that. So, um, you know, if we look forward next year, we don't actually know the calendar. So in terms of like testing tape or timing, that that's an interesting one. Um, there are different dynamics going on this season than, than next as well. I mean, for uh, many athletes, next year is about performance at the games, of course, but this year is about qualification. It's about the internal battles between the athletes as much as uh, performance. So we did see a number of athletes prioritize the test event and not race um, prior. Um, you know, in some cases, not race, uh, you know, for much of June or July into the, the August test event. Um, I try, we try to balance, you know, the series is still important as well. So there are different um, dynamics. I mean, there's certainly the the bigger the federation you're from in terms of support and resources, the more I think you can tend to focus on the games completely. But um, as, as we saw the, the discussion about the test event prize money being uh, modest compared to other events around, in fact, it was the same as the World Cup, you know, and uh, my mind always goes, do you, do you know what the price money of the Olympics is? <laughs> well, it's, it's zero. <laughs> um, so there is this other professional dynamic. And of course, I mean, one of the, I suppose, the, the factors of the games is the pull of this event is so significant that athletes will choose to do it over over necessarily the maximum you know professional earnings that they could have. But that's an, always a, a dynamic that's in play. And even... You'd even say, you know, we talked about the relay. I mean, the the pull uh, for athletes to race Sunderland because there was a relay there, for example. Uh, we, we, you know, that that was something that, that we dealt with as well. Uh, but that last race is an interesting one. You know, when, when do you do it? Um, we saw, not, you know, neither of the test event winners raced in, raced, uh, in Sunderland the, the couple of weeks before. Um, and a number of the the French they did race, uh, and but also were good. So uh, whether or not there are conclusions there is up to the individuals. I probably say not worth the risk in terms of a games point of view next year to race two two or three weeks before in case you know if an athlete has a crash or you know becomes ill due to water or or whatever you know how do you minimize sort of risks in in that case. Uh, but but in a general sense, we know at major events like Olympics, if you can reproduce what you've done before uh, under the special conditions, the pressure, the expectation, the the whole circus that comes along with um, uh, with the games, then you know that that's your 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 best indicator of performance. I think many athletes struggle to reproduce what they've done before, and particularly we're talking about athletes who are capable of of meddling if we. If we think of the medal zone might go, you know, six to eight deep at the test event or the final as the most competitive um, standard distance races of the year. You know, how many of those six to eight in either of those will will turn up with a similar performance in the games next year? So that that's what we're kind of going for is how do you reproduce the, that kind of performance under under the the pressure of the games? And, you know, what do you what do you keep the same or how much do you sort of put push through and. My, my experience is certainly keeping something in reserve and in the Olympic year is, is a good strategy uh, because inevitably things take longer. There's more energy expended in the buildup. There's more interviews. There's more focus. Uh, all of this stuff takes energy uh, that takes away from recovery, that takes away from or it can take away from the training process if, if you let it. So, you know, I think having a buffer there too is is a useful uh, protocol in terms of uh, eliciting a consistent peak performance at the games. With with that, with the buffer and keeping something in reserve, um, is that in terms of the training or the racing schedule or other commitments like uh, sponsors and and what have you, or just a mix of of all of the above? It's a mix of all those. I mean, I've seen. A, I mean, we know this from probably you know any in any major event. You know, I mean, how how many athletes left their best Kona race well before the race? You know, they 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 um, stretch too far. You know, in the build up to that, but equally that happens in, in the games as well. You know, athletes thinking that they need to do that extra bit in order to to elicit their best performance, and you know that you know that kind of drive that motivation. 
you know, comes with risk and, and you know, what's going to derail performances in, in a major events that matter to you are, uh, you know, your physical integrity, you know, again, niggles, in injury issues. I mean, that's going to take out a few contenders as it always does. Uh, and then illness, uh, certainly that that inevitably takes out a couple more, um, you know, that, that we've seen. Uh, some illness, of course, is avoidable and some it's you know more difficult to avoid. Uh, but of course, the closer you are to your to your limits in terms of training, stress, life stress, recovery, the 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 more likely that that stuff tends to happen. So uh, it, it's all those things. I mean, even in the the context of you know a small sport like triathlon, or you know where there's generally not so much wide media interest except for the games. Um, you know, being able to say no and create some boundaries around that. Um, every you know sponsor, federations, media, they want to you know activate as much as they can before the games. But of course, all that comes at a cost. And while there's some athletes who like to engage in that and maybe they're more extroverted and gain energy from that kind of attention, for others that will be exhausting and 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 it potentially could impact their performance. So understanding you know the athlete that you know we're we're dealing with uh, is part of that you know how do we optimize protect them a little bit um help them to say no if they need to or um you know create a period where we're still doing the stuff that drives performance you know that eat sleep train focus uh we're still protecting that space that that we know we'll, we'll get a predictable performance from yeah that's that's really interesting and uh from the test event uh, could you what learnings did you draw from that about preparation race dynamics and any anything else that comes to mm. mind well i mean the 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 obvious one at first was was there going to be a swim um and uh, obviously we saw uh the elites were able to swim para were not and then the, the relay back uh, i'm confident there'll be a swim next year uh, we learned something about the sand and how quickly it flows and, and that but uh yeah you know, there was a little bit of a, a concern about that um beforehand um but olympics as a duathlon would really be something wouldn't it but uh, i don't think we'll i don't think we'll get that although we did get um actually no the relay was a duathlon as well wasn't it um but yeah, the swim was um, more selective than usual in the sense of of the gaps um, that we normally see, you know, distance from the front. And, you know, you, we've got to give a, a shout out to tristats.com, who produ produces fantastic um, world triathlon focused data, very timely, you know, that, sh you know, wonderful little graphs that show, you know, where the peak densities were coming out of the water. And we, you know, if you could generalize in both the men's and women's, um it was perhaps more spread out or there was a more distinctive second group that was farther away from the front than perhaps usual and and there's a very strong current it's it's up to half a meter per second in in the sand and so you've got a, a push from the beginning you know a strong uh down current makes it very fast very dense at the first buoy because ever you know the differences are, are less and then a significant up up current swim uh for for that first lap now when I was watching the races this year, I was thinking in, in particularly the men's um, thinking, you know, some of the athletes where they came out of the water, they, there would be no way they could recover from that in a normal race, um, given the, the gap from the front. But then we saw in particular the men's race, quite a, a negative racing dynamic um, with athletes looking at each other, not willing to work, um, you know, uh, more so than we might typically see in that in that scenario and um in particular the course being so wide in most parts even though the, the surface you know we have the on the champs elysees you have the you know the cobbles um quite rough in some spots the the south um the other side of the river was 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 quite fine surface wise but in general very wide which is what tend to tend to be what you get in, a, in an olympic style course uh, so the bike in itself wasn't very selective uh, extremely fast and i mean you know looking at the power files the way that it was ridden this year uh, maybe 30 to 50 watts less than a, a more uh, technical bike course, normalized power. So that's also partly we saw the, the quality of the running and, and the number of athletes who ran fast was in part the way that it was raced. 
uh, in the women's race, it split, you know, whether it was 24, 25 in the first group and the rest were really quite far behind in, in the end. So it wasn't exactly the same dynamic as almost every man in the field was in the front group, um, which does create a, quite a transition um, congestion, which is, all, all, you know, part, part of the, the skills of, of, of world travel and racing is how do you navigate yourself to the front of T2 if you can, um, you know, to, to start in such a massive group in the front, it's going to be 15 seconds maybe from the front to the back, which is a massive uh, gap if you've got to try to chase that down. So I mean, even in a, even in a big roll around race like that, uh, there is still the in, in, inner races within the race that happens. But um, yeah, what well, can we expect the games to be like that? Um, perhaps not. I mean, it, the athletes can make, the race so just because the bike course isn't as technical um it doesn't have that innate demand it, it, you know the athletes can can make that more demanding by the way that they race it but in the test event we don't see quite as much of that because of the you know an athlete's racing for a top eight and they know um you know ninth is no good then they might sort of protect that sort of top eight position or or energy for that versus taking the risk that they might might blow up and and the athletes looking at each other from from those um those dynamics and of course the other factor with the games that's always interesting is uh you're remote due to the smaller field um you remove some of the top athletes so there's a couple french couple germans couple americans couple brits you know that all tend to be missing because the maximum of course is only is only three athletes and indeed even getting the quota of three athletes has changed since the it it was the same in in tokyo but the the number of countries that are able to get three uh, is less because it's it's um the way that it works by the ranking is essentially you got to have three athletes in the top 30 where it used to roll down beyond that. So actually very few countries even have three of, of each gender uh, in the race, which, which also has an impact on, you know, you get a wider range of athletes at the games than you tend to see at any other build up event. Um, so there's a number of things that, that we learned. I mean, I suppose you would, you would say to generalize, uh, better swim a lot and be very fit running would be the, the easy takeaway, uh, which is not terribly different than than a normal world triathlon race. But, um, you know, of course, it's quite different than having observed, you know, perhaps a bike that was very demanding or that had, uh, you know, a, a hill or, or a series of hills, you know, that, that would have impacted the training uh, into it in a way that um, maybe is not present for the Paris Games. Yeah. I mean, just out of curiosity, though, uh, what sort of bike courses that we do see on the circuit right now would you say are the most conducive for creating separation? Because, uh, yeah, we have those wide streets in Paris that we saw created a bit large pack of men coming into T2. But on the other hand, a lot of courses with lots of U-turns and, and turns in general also seem to get get the packs to really bunch up in in those turns so uh so what are your thoughts on that where, where do we have the biggest chance of getting separation versus not hmm. yeah u-turns are not good for creating separation of course uh be, be just i mean the you the just the dynamics of rolling into the turn with higher speed if you're if you're approaching and um so that that's not the, the best of course i mean these days hills have to be really significant in order to to have you know it will filter the field but but these guys are all very strong it's it's not like there's very many that 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 would be separated just due to the hill but it's it's the repeated nature of corners and hills um you know even a, a race like bermuda uh, which we had last year that i mean the hill it's a minute minute and a half so i mean everyone can ride a minute minute and a half but when you've got to go eight laps plus the other technical and fast corners so not u-turns but other other types of corners um it, it was interesting watching i mean it's a very extreme example but the the world cycling championships in glasgow that was essentially the city center circuit that had uh what 20 corners per lap i mean it was much longer than our races uh but but the you know interesting to to listen to the the road cyclists talk about you know how do you race a, a crit style race with hills and corners and and the demands there that saw so many fall away 
uh, again, not a direct comparison, but there is something about the different types of courses that we see. And, and uh, maybe we saw, we saw the cyclocross uh, stars rise in, in that particular race, uh, you know, with repeated sprints and that. But I suppose a course with short hills and, and uh, technical corners that are not 180s would be, would be the most likely to separate it. But again, the athletes can, can make the race. I mean, often we, we see on the very first lap of the bike, you know, a group away that it didn't look like that coming out of the water, but they, there was splits. They created that by the way that they raced with, with aggression by, you know, they, you know, with, and to make that happen, you have to, you know, pretty much ride the first lap or the first five minutes at max effort in order to make that happen. And you need multiple people that are committed to doing that same thing. And it only takes one or two not to pull through that, that wrecks that dynamic. So it's really up to the athletes how they choose to race it and, and their own approach. And, and that's why you see it's so difficult to make happen because people have different agendas. They have, you know, they may come out of the water already a bit gassed compared to another athlete and maybe not wanting to pull through. Maybe they want to follow wheels more so. Uh, but when there is a successful breakaway, we often see that you know, come right out of the, on the first lap of the bike, there's already a gap and then it, and then it's going out. And it's because those athletes that are in there are equally committed to making that happen. And there's not too many passengers. Maybe you can have one or two, uh, but it's also the group size, you know, any more than six, seven, eight, and then it starts to get too many. Uh, and, and you inevitably get people that are missing turns or not pulling through. And that tends to affect the dynamics. So there's something to learn even just, you know, we know that's how cycling races happen. Obviously ours finishes with the run. So you have, a, there is a different dynamic, but, but equally there's similar, similar impacts on, on how the athletes choose to race. Mm, yeah. So one other thing that I want to touch on, which we did very briefly uh, talk about in uh, the previous interview we did, was about peaking or tapering. And uh, yeah, I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that in, in a bit more detail. What are your perspectives on it? Mm. Yeah, that has probably not changed too much over time. But my, whenever I talk about peaking, oh, the, the expression that comes to mind is that perhaps it's overrated as a concept or a, an objective um peaking mean to me meaning um you know uh, the best performance of the year uh, physiologically or, or holistically that um they perhaps you, you did something special to achieve that uh, but but i've really tried to take a consistency approach to i suppose it is demanded by the world series so of course in in olympic triathlon the world champion is is um, a product of the four best races plus the final. So you have to be sort of good for the series. And, and that's been one of the goals of, of our group for, for a number of years. Uh, but that, that I've really found, I think, a, a formula of being consistently good and how to manage the periodization to elicit that consistency through the year. So it can require being, you know, very good in in both March and all the way through the season. If our final is in August or September, being being almost equally as good, uh, if if not as good. So, I think that has to do with the training load management and building in periods of retraining or rebuilding at various times when you can. I mean, the calendar is not the same every year, but there is that sort of concept of uh, a period of build up racing recovering and another build up as opposed to trying to maintain a a very high level uh in terms of okay what is what elicits that is typically the most specific high load training elicits sort of that that um peak performance capability if you like but i think where we go wrong is trying to hold on to that specific training phase that competition phase too long and it becomes unsustainable ultimately most likely because of the the intensity, the recovery that's required, uh, and and often that's associated with a slightly lower training volume, slightly lower chronic load, and too much, in my worldview, too much time of lower chronic load, you're you're ultimately going to lose fitness. It's going to degrade o- over time if you have a a long enough time frame, and and the the classic. Um, periodization errors that I often think about is, you know, entering the competition phase of specific training too soon and trying to maintain that th- throughout the season. So when I'm thinking about, you know, whether it's Olympics or, or you know, top level uh, races, um, 
I'm thinking, how, how do we maintain, you know, build ourselves up to a, a high level of performance and then rebuild through this season so that we can do that multiple times? So it, it's, you, some might look at that as a multi, multi periodization model. I'm perhaps looking at it more like, more like a, uh, an approach that can el elicit a consistent high level of performance. Uh, that it isn't an entire periodization behind that, but it is uh, thinking about how you plan and prepare uh, to to do that through the season. So, in terms of peaking, uh, you know, again, I look at the major events that we want to do. We want to be able to have a predictable performance that we've done similar before. That's most likely how we're going to elicit that. And um, and I th I believe we can do that multiple times through the year and. and um, and that also has the the side effect, I suppose, of building confidence throughout the year. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket and going into races underdone. But in fact, uh, that that psychological impact of demonstrating to yourself what you're doing is 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 effective. We're having good performances, and we're able to do that consistently to build their athletes the athletes confidence to deliver that on the day that matters the most. Yeah, yeah. And uh, would you say that when you get to the end of the season, and whether you're in a rebuilding phase or in a, let's say, second or third or whatever it is, competitive training phase, are the athletes able to sustain a similar chronic load that they did uh, on the in, in the earlier parts of the season? Or, or has the accumulative load had an impact so that you have to manage that a little bit and maybe maybe have a lower workload there? What What, yeah, what would you say there? Uh, it depends how long we have to work with, uh, you know, it's, it often, you know, the calendar dictates that to a degree, but I think how I like to manage that is by coming back to manipulating the, the intensity. So if we want to build that chronic load up, we're going to have to drop away some of that race, spe race specific intensity. And it's like having the confidence that as the season progresses, you can do less of that specific preparation you don't need as much is basically my view that that we can you know we can come back to uh, basic aerobic training or sub threshold work and and we don't need that stimulus as much uh, you know whether it be specific training or, or race race specific intensity we can do much less of that so i think again the the where i feel like we've gone wrong in the past in in between racing periods is trying to revisit maybe even a similar race specific block to what we did early in the year and it then it starts to feel like it's starting to burn them it's too long they're not able to sustain the intensity part of it so we need that recharge of of lower intensity volume work uh in order to create that capacity to go and race again or to rebuild the the underpinning capacity to go and race again so um those specific phases just get shorter and shorter you know we're in an interesting phase as we're speaking now between the test event and the grand final and you know we find ourselves again you know, not doing as much specific work just now and then we'll just have a real short um uh, finals uh, specific block maybe only of a week you know, into the, into the final where previously we might have done two three or at the beginning of the year it might be four or five or six weeks of specific work where we might just in here at the at the end just do that really short specific sharpener uh having had rebuilt some of that aerobic work underpinning that mm, yeah that's very interesting and what about the the tapering part of of things how do you approach a race a key race like the grand final or the test event in terms of just deloading in the last i don't know yeah how long do you use and, and how, what does it look like yeah it, it depends primarily on how long the block was before so if we've had uh uh you know maybe an eight week block like prior to the may races at least in the current world triathlon calendar there's a big gap of of top level races so we might have a very long build up and then the, the taper needs to be a little bit longer to manage that but but for us that that's only as much as about 14 days where we would start to look at bringing the volume of intensity down a little bit we might bring the volume down just a little bit but maintain frequency and then race week uh 
it depends on where we're traveling to, whether there's time zones um, and, uh, and and what that context was before. But we try to keep the race week fairly similar. So there's that predictability of the same type of sharpening sessions, uh, the same week template if we if we can do it. Um, uh, the, the difference with, you know, when we have unusual events like the test event that aren't on the usual days, they're not on a weekend, then we have to go through, okay, what, how are we going to line this up to create that predictability, to create that patterning that gets us ready to race? So, of course, we can't just, you know, if, if we, we typically work in seven-day microcycles, just easier in the world uh, to function that way. And so we have to chop some of that out to then to line it up uh, for for an unusual race day. Now, that's not most people's context. And most races are on the weekends. So that Monday to Friday is going to look very similar for almost all of our races. Uh, similar, there, there, we have a few variations depending on the chronic load before race week or the two weeks before. But it's minor stuff. It's just the volume of intensity that's changing. So, you know, uh, some ra- you know races we, we might do, um, you know, five or six by 400 meters or one minute uh, run sh- uh, strides. Uh, if um, a variation might on that might be uh, slightly longer ones, um, you know, might be two minutes or 800 meters, for example. So we're, we're just, we're playing around with how much stimulus to give um, intensity race week, but the frequency, the pattern is still the same. So in a, in a longer taper, we'll have shorter, um, uh, shorter race specific sharpening work and in a shorter taper longer, um, you know, in order to, um, to try, to try to get that predictability of performance. And even an, an interesting point, I mean, we've just had athletes race some, you know, you might call it minor races, you know, French Grand Prix and that where we've um, experimented with um, doing um, very little race week taper. And and it's often surprising how good the performances come from that, uh, from, from an approach with very little tapering of performance. And it does lead to me to to reflect on how, how many of us sort of overthink tapering race week and how we can derail ourselves with um, – you know, too much change, um, particularly athletes who aren't uh, riding the edge of the maximum training load that they could possibly absorb, you know, that we, we simply drop it down because we think we're supposed to because it's a race, so we should taper. Uh, however, you know, often that, you know, can have the impact of athletes who talk about feeling flat or feeling have they only have one gear or they felt sort of sleepy in the race or, you know, that, that sort of a variation that tells us that something was off uh, they weren't feeling like their normal self uh, and so i think that routine that momentum that rhythm that we can lead into races likely to give us a, a predictable representable performance a representative performance that's what we're after really and i always hate to hear that that feedback oh i felt flat i felt i had no you know i got one gear no speed and think oh you know what 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 happened there? We either over rested or under recovered. Uh, I think I see it frequently over over recovered or over rested. We've we've lost the rhythm. We've we've not had enough stimulus then to to produce a performance that we think is is was appropriate. It was was representative of where they're at. So it, it, again, these Would things will say- we go on. <laughs> Does, does overresting more typically come from uh, just reducing volume too much or reducing intensity too much, or can it be any of the two? I, I see some athletes that are um, fearful of being tired race week, and they they often they do both. They want to do less intensity usually, or they're afraid to do intensity race intensity, uh, and often then the volume also comes down. So we have sort of that double impact of, of stimulus changing. And um, I mean, it, I suppose that it is, it is something that I have adapted over time. There are some athletes that really do seem to bounce from reducing their training stimulus significantly. Um, so the, the, this is not, it's not a uni- universal um, commentary when I'm thinking of, you know, many, many over recovery. There are some that really do respond to, to a, a big drop in training stimulus and um you know maybe of 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 my group has here i think of the top of my head say we've got 10 athletes maybe two might be like that 
uh, of this particular group, for example. And uh, now there are most that are sort of in the middle. They benefit definitely from reducing the training load and, and you know, want to see that recovery start to take place before the race week. So before Monday switches over to race week, you know, we, we, we manipulate the training load so that we're starting to drop that down. Even if they, they never feel as good as quickly as they want, you know, oh, we've started to taper. How come I don't feel good yet? But of course, you know, it doesn't work. This is not as fast as that. Um, but, but, but yeah, so I think that that individual approach and understanding the athlete. And um, so if an athlete for, you know, we try to feel it out in other races in the build-up, but also, uh, you know, often athletes have come to us because they want to change. They want to find, uh, you know, new performances or they, they want to improve themselves. And so, you know, you hear, what have you done before for taper? We have that discussion. And then what the standard approach that we might take might be. And then how, how do we sort of experiment how do we figure out what's going to be right for them also in a new context because you know like we started on this tapering topic it depends what their training model has been how much chronic load have they been typically doing how much can they tolerate uh would impact the optimal taper length even if we're not talking about too much difference you know it could be a few days difference but you know i've I've had plenty of times where it was obvious to me that the athlete was at their they were much better a week later than the target event than than, uh, that i had hoped and then therefore okay and we might come back to what that context was how could we adjust things in the future on an individual basis while still you know, we, the, the date of the event doesn't change. The demands of the event don't change. So, you know, the factors we have are, are individual and, and how do we produce a predictable performance from that? Yeah. So so in your general ta- template that, that would work for the, the typical uh, athlete in your squad, how, how much volume roughly would would they do in the final seven days before the race? Mm. Uh, and, and also what would the number of those kind of... Uh, intensity workouts that you describe the activation workouts be would it be a similar patterns which i think is you usually do two two runs and two bikes and two swims that are have intensity or would you reduce the frequency and maybe only do one of each uh, so mm-hmm. yeah those two questions i guess yeah i mean it, it definitely it it, it in, inevitably drops down the weekend before so if we were if we were doing a typical saturday long run slash uh, session um you know that could be anywhere from 75 minutes to an hour 45 let's say well that's going to be on the lower end the weekend before the race so that might be an hour to 75 minutes depending who we're dealing with so so that's already a, a drop uh, and often we do bike sessions on a sunday and you know that depends again where we're at in the cycle i mean that could be anywhere from three to four hours on a typical sunday well it's going to be half that uh prior to a race week if in a typical way to to do things so then once we get into race week the pattern is the same so the the days that we tend to do uh sharpening sessions it's the same weekly template but of course what's different is the weekend so of course the volume of race week ends up dropping because the the race distances, uh, even if it's a standard distance race or, or longer, it's less than we would normally train typically. So, of course, the race week volume is deceptive based on that because the the weekend is is different. So, um, yeah, so we try to maintain that same pattern of activation because I think that frequency of activation is help, helps you maintain that rhythm and momentum into a race. But would, would the volume of those sessions in race week be changed if you normally do a four to five thousand meter swim? Would that be now a three thousand meter swim or something, or or what does that look like? It, it, exactly, yeah. Both the volume of the session down, yeah. So it could be going from yeah four to five to three to four. Uh, the runs are going to be slightly shorter if we were you know normally doing say a seventy five to 90 minute run on a tuesday that that might be 45 minutes to an hour so the volume is definitely going down as well and p- part of that is is psychological so the athletes see that something is different it primes them to to be ready to race but partly we're also understanding that okay we might be traveling you know that's going to take uh, a, a stress it's it's it, you know we're going to go to the airport one day this you know even even short trips uh, still take half a day 
So we want to build in energy for that as well. So it, 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 that's also a factor that we're trying to manage is, is uh, that buffer sort of concept for recovery, given that there'll be additional stresses that, that aren't present in a normal week. Hmm, got it. Um, yeah, so the next topic, uh, I, I have no clue if this will be a very short one or a very long one, but let's see. So we touched on technology and uh, to some extent like advances, advances in sports science. Uh, last time we chatted and you talked about the need for really good filtering uh, as a coach, as an athlete. So if we revisit this topic uh, now, four years later uh have you yeah is there anything that you've let's say introduced from the world of uh sports science or from techno technological tools that you use now mm. that you maybe didn't then uh, not not a, not as a whole um i think the the evolution of sports nutrition products and and the the understanding of of um carb intakes has had an impact i think a positive impact of um you know, the understanding how that's evolved over the last decade. And that's something that, that we certainly look at and think about, um, you know, particularly in, in race fueling, although there's still the issue of the, the distance of the race we're talking about, obviously, is an important context. But but I have observed, you know, since 2019, it doesn't feel like that long ago, but you know, the, the, the continued explosion of um, wearables and devices um, that, that have come into the market uh, is still very interesting to me. And it's still something where I feel like a, a strong filter is, is very valuable because it's so easy to go down rabbit holes and become distracted with, with different technologies that, that come out and that are heavily promoted and and uh, so that, that's always been sort of my, my or, orientation is to to think about what can I implement on a you know a world class basis. What's going to help me make better decisions in the moment? Um, how do I avoid getting sort of snowed under with so much data that I can't make sense of you know how this might help or drawing wisdom out of data? I think is it, isn't it is it constantly evolving topic and you know we've seen explosions of 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 um data across professional sports and making sense of that i think is is an is still an, an evolution and um you know i i have athletes you know that turn up with um wearables that measure sleep and and others that you know purport to measure some kind of training load or hrv continues and it's difficult to find the signal in all of that. Um, you know, I, I think we often, you know, ascribe more uh, validity than perhaps is in reality to, to a lot of these devices. Very attractive that, you know, that we can, um, you know, wear this device and there's a, an algorithm that's probably not open source. It's probably a black box algorithm that spits out something that sort of looks right, that could be useful, but but making sense of that is is tricky, and um, you know I'm no different than everyone. I'm so, can be motivated by new things, new gadgets that might help me uh, support the athletes better or make better decisions. But I still find myself with sort of a natural skepticism towards a lot of the this technology. You know, and I follow you know various people in this space who, you know, over time. You know, an example is I think her name is Sean, Dr. Sean Allen, who who um, has a has a Twitter X account and and often is talking about the wearable space and you know and especially like one of the recent ones with sleep trackers and you think you know on analysis of these street sleep trackers compared to lab uh, sleep tracking you know with a whole device on your head while you're sleeping in a lab etc. Turns out a lot of these are, are not great at even measuring the hours that you're actually sleeping. And, and they're, so there's something, you know, that's resembling sleep cycles, but perhaps the evidence isn't as strong as, as we think. And, and I've got athletes with these and, you know, often we take a look at them and, you know, it, it often feels sort of retroactive. You know, we're, we're looking at something after it happens. The athletes has got got sick or got ill or they're not recovering. So then we go in and look after it. Oh, we see some kind of looks like a correlation. But in terms of information that helps us in the moment make, make better decisions, I think this is it's a tough space because there, there's so much that, that potentially could help, but it is hard to make sense of. 
So there was a, there was a quote that I, I came across recently that sort of resonated with me, which was, um, uh, bad data is worse than no data. <laughs> And it sort of sums up, I think, my my skepticism around some of some of this stuff, um, in that it, it's just very easy to get distracted. And you know, I observed a couple of things. You know, one program that I was involved with, aware of that, um, you know, they started sort of changing their training they were going to do on the day based on um, these the wearables, the sleep wearables, and what the disconnect seemed to be was. Um, how the athletes felt and what they were reporting. So it was sort of giving sort of too much weight to what the wearable was saying. And, and, and I think inevitably we could have come back to speaking with athletes, understanding their moods, understanding how they feel, and also giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, you know, cause a lot of that, you know, if you can talk yourself out of doing training for all kinds of different reasons and that impact of psychology, uh, and physiology, psychology, and, and training is, is very interesting to me. I think that that's probably the space that I continue to gravitate back to is is how to be more a more effective uh, coaching psychologist, uh, as it were, or the integration of psychology in training. So, yeah, this this filter thing, I, I think, it remains important. I mean, I have noticed um, for. for obvious reasons in the triathlon world you know the the re-emergence of lactate testing uh, uh you know in 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 the public consciousness and even beyond probably where where it's been and i mean uh, you know that this is not a new concept i mean athletes have been doing lactate testing for 20 years or more um all the way back to capillary tubes before before they were you know the original you know, um, devices that look like, like they do now where you do a, a blood drop. Um, but, but that sort of emergence has been interesting to observe. Um, you know, uh, I've always found it sort of difficult and not necessarily adding more value to justify the cost and the complexity within a, a group environment uh, for myself. But I've observed how I think it's a, sort of a trend in, in performance sport where, People do what they think they're supposed to be doing. There's a certain sort of image of what a high performance sport look like. It's very, you know, you you you're meant to be sophisticated. You're meant to be using a lot of to, you know testing and and all of this. And I've you know even just the athletes taking photos of their lactate meters with the values on them has been an interesting sort of trend. Um, and you think, well, why is that? What what is, what is behind that uh, as as a as a trend? And you know. I'm skeptical of the value that's being implemented in many cases. So I mean, certainly I'm open. I'm not a closed in, in terms of methodology at all, but, but I, I really found it valuable over time to think carefully about what I integrate and, uh, you know, sort of re reverted in, in often to coming back to basics of, of, of run speed and distance and, um, you know, bike power. And of course we have, you know, hundreds of data points every week from from a from a, a group of athletes training. So there's no shortage of data, but you know, probably the the limiter limiting factor is what I can impl influence. What can I implement that um, helps me make better decisions? And so th that that sort of filter remains even uh, since we spoke last. There's more and more in in this space, and and I think often we have this, um, you know rush to market for for gadgets and then you often see well you wonder is the algorithm that they're using because often it it's based on that you know uh the you know you see you know the the core temperature um device that measures skin, you know skin temperature ultimately and has an algorithm to interpret the core temperature uh which is seems to be more or less accurate ish <laughs> Right, um, you know, for, for example, but there's some algorithm there that that's figuring that out, right? It, it's it's not a direct chord measure, or I mean, the, the obvious one that's always interesting that athletes get, you know, they get a new Garmin device and uh, they're either at altitude or heat, and and the device is telling them how acclimated they are to to whatever conditions, and um, often athletes turn that off pretty fast, <laughs> you know, or, or it tells them the recovery days, the amount of hours it's going to take to recover. Uh, and maybe as an example of ones that for most people who are experienced with well, athletes that are experienced are obviously probably not correct, 
but that's I think a typical of this kind of space that you know if you're new to the sport uh, new to sport it might give you something but once you've got further along you kind of question the value there or what's what's beneath that so yeah, I mean, that's a, a long-winded answer of, of uh, uh, where I sort of see the technology space. Um, uh, and in terms of new things, uh, we've experimented with uh, some devices that, that measure swimming technique. Uh, again, accelerometers. Um, however, you know, push comes to shove, I still struggle to find something that's very useful that I can apply based on that. So I often will try some different things, but in the end I find myself coming, you know, to the conclusion that pulling pulling the signal out of the the data is difficult. Yeah, I think that's the the key thing that you say there. Can you can you find something of value that will improve your uh, your process and and your outcomes? And and that's often, I think, uh, one th- something that applies very well to this space is uh, the Goodhart's law. Uh, when when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good a good measure. And I think that can be applied to many of these things for in a lot of for a lot of people. Not everybody. For some people, they they are good at using some. I guess wearables or technologies as a more secondary supporting measure that can just help understand context a bit better if it's a but then again it comes back to what you said earlier is the data accurate so you have to have confidence in in that as well so not not all of these wearables can be used in in that sense either um mm-hmm. but yeah I think I think we're on the same page so let's move on to something that you mentioned uh there which uh, I also wanted to chat about which is uh psychology so how important you already said that you consider it very important but how how is that something that athletes work on uh, actively or even indirectly uh, and how 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 much how big a part does it play in performance at the world class level it's it can't be overstated how important it is really it's it, i think it's integrated in everything that athletes do and, and and so so much is about how the athletes perceive themselves the preparation they do the the, the performance that they're capable of at times can can be fragile and and even the, the how do you build an athlete's confidence is, is a tricky thing and I, I like to think of it as integrated in the training plan from the design of the training plan and how do we set up a training plan that the athletes feel successful at completing to build their confidence and this maybe contrasts to some approaches they're aware of that present more of the big challenge the the trying to create situations that challenge athletes resilience that they might fail at and have to try again and you know these you know challenges to failure um my approach is very different than that it's i'm always thinking how do i create the training plan or the training tasks to achieve the highest possibility that the athlete will be successful to achieve what i've planned or prescribed for them such that we're building their confidence because i often think if if an athlete can't complete a training session either i've um, misinterpreted where their recovery and capabilities are so so it's my fault or i've not heard their feedback or um there's something missing there and and i never i always my working assumption that is athletes always try their best to complete what you what the task is then then you know very rarely do i find athletes who i come across in any case who are not motivated to complete to their best of ability whatever you put in front of them they they want they they know that you think that they can do it for the most part so if they can't do it then they start to think there's something missing in them so i try to avoid that um uh, so i'm always i think that's my orientation is always trying to integrate that into everything that we're doing so that we, we're building confidence through successful completion of the training plan a successful completion of the intensities that we anticipate and some of that is even about building the ranges so that they know that you know their threshold their functional threshold or how, whatever you know lt1 lt2 these are not you know numbers that are so precise there there are ranges on any given day so also broadening the range of what a successful session might be uh so that they you know if they're on the lower end that's all right if they're on the higher end well within reason that can be all right as long as it doesn't start to impact what we can do the next day and and following but but so it's integrated in that sense and how we talk about 
our tasks, how we talk about what success looks like in training and, and even how we debrief races in that process, trying to set the expectation that, uh, you know, achieving your potential as an athlete, it takes time. There's really no kind of shortcuts. We can maximize our rate of improvement. But for the most part, you know, this is a multi-year process for, for any given athlete. And um, and so how we talk about uh, training and, and racing and competition and debriefing is in the same. It's it's integrated in that same way. So I think inevitably being coaching by definition we're not just a physiologist imp- implementing uh, you know a, a training prescription uh, there's the people side the 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 understanding the person understanding what how you how you can um usually it's harness their motivation because usually you know particularly in in the space that that we work in you know the athlete's motivation is is strong. They they want to they want to improve their performance. Uh, they're not being forced to by any means. It's entirely voluntary. This this process and and we're trying to guide that usually to avoid them uh, doing too much or too much in the wrong direction or um or or sort of compensating and chasing confidence. This is a, a theme that is is infinite in the elite space. Is, is athletes who are influenced by the performance of others, not you know normal. But then, if that goes uh, in a bad direction, we start to chase what we think that others may be doing in training, or we start to um, believe that others are doing things that are are much higher level than than where the athlete in front of us is currently at that they may not be ready for, or is not even real. You know this. You know I've often talked about this you know, the, the impacts of social media on and Strava as a training social media on, on other athletes. They, they see, you know, epic training sessions, massive training sessions very fast without understanding the context. And that can influence their confidence in what they're doing. So that, that's a dynamic that didn't used to exist that now we have to uh, manage in some way. And, um, you know, it's really about, you know, the right training for the right athlete in this moment is right. It doesn't matter what the the athlete who's winning the race today is doing. It only matters what's right for you in this moment. So even just reinforcing that, that kind of process and and even the very best athletes are susceptible to, to this kind of uh, influence from, from outside. Um, It impacts all, 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 everyone, every, every human is impacted by what others are doing. So, Again, in that way, it's part and parcel of performance. Uh, talk, you know how we how we talk about training, how we talk about what we're trying to do, reinforcing patience, reinforcing process, not ourselves getting carried away in this ego game of performance, which which can be very quickly self destructive. Uh, I think we've all sort of seen now, you know, the training hero that perhaps is not as consistent uh, as we as they might need to be and then underperforms in races frequently uh, and then comes back and what do they try to do they try to train harder they try to push themselves more and 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 can further that cycle uh, so so many of the athletes become you know self saboteurs from this process that that uh, that occurs and you know i think our role as coaches is to is to as much as possible, intervene in that process and, and offer perspective and objectivity uh, that it kind of transcends just the physiology. It's again, it's not just numbers. It's not just a prescription. It, it's how we talk about that. What do we reinforce? What do we not reinforce? And you know, a big challenge I think for for coaches always is, you know, we get too excited if an athlete overshoots their training targets because it looks good, <laughs> it feels good. You know, they went. But then, well, what's the impact on that? Maybe one, maybe one day, it's it's nothing really. But maybe if that starts to become a trend, uh, you know, that the ability to recover starts to suffer, and then maybe now we've got to take the week off because we've been overcooking it progressively over the last several weeks, for example. Or even it can be as simple as, um, you know, we often the example in world triathlon, but but also middle distance is. Um, overcook a run session and it impacts your ability to do the bike session the next day or the couple of days after. And, uh, you know, and then we, it becomes counterproductive in the same way. Uh, of course we've got to perform across swim, bike, run. It's not, it's not just one discipline. And if we over prioritize, uh, for example, the over prioritize the favorite discipline or over prioritize the, the discipline where the athlete feels the most competent, it's the most easiest one. It's the easiest one to, um, 
to to overdo and then what is the impact on on the other two so i think that's the you know the unique part about about triathlon but um it, it's a it's a constant process and and uh i think um probably every coach can can get better or more intentional about how they talk about training intentional about thinking you know the words they use the way we talk about training impacts the outcome of the training program it's and again it's not just what training how we talk about it, how we think about it how do we integrate and develop psychology into into what we do as coaches uh i think it's a huge growth opportunity especially in this in this current moment of the science of training be evolving um you know the awareness of of physiology is probably never been higher you know across a wider group uh, and a lot of the the psychological stuff while well, there is ways to there are ways to quantify through um through questionnaires or, or survey there are ways to try to quantify psychology uh but but it's an area of development i'm sure for 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 every coach for, certainly for myself i have to remind myself always to be thinking about this uh, and and it's one of the biggest challenges we face you know athletes with low confidence or who haven't had maybe maybe they've had a series of performances that that were that were under performances and trying to understand that how do you climb out of that sort of hole uh, the performances could be related to training or not, but and yet if you find an athlete who's in a low state, who, who's not feeling so confident, it might even change the way that they race, which might further the problem. You can end up in this vicious circle of athletes who are approaching the race sort of on the back foot, not so assertive with what how they need to race. And of course, that can just further the problem. So how do you break those kind of cycles? Do you use smaller races, lower competitive races to build that? Uh, or are there other tools you might use that, again, sort of transcend just simple period, uh, periodization, planning, and, and physiology? Yeah, that's a great answer. And it, it reminds me of, well, by the time we record this a uh, few days ago, I released a podcast with uh, Lachlan Kirin, and we had a discussion about AI in, in coaching. And, and all the things that you just said there is just one example of why it's just really hard to see uh, like the AI coach being more than a helpful tool that coaches can use for some aspects of their work but definitely not the replacement mm. because that's something that, that i believe is well at least we're very far away from ai mm. being able to to do all of those things um mm. but i know we're, we're running short on time uh do you have a hard out or can we skip to the last two questions perhaps on the on the sheet i'm good for time all right so so then uh just a general question for specific for age groupers in this case. If you mm -hmm. could give one tip uh, about each of the three disciplines, swim, biking, and running, for how age group athletes listening to this can uh, perhaps improve their training and their performance. Mm. With, with swimming, I, I come back to frequency as, as such a powerful tool. And maybe I hope it doesn't seem like a cop out as a, as a tip, but you know, certainly swimming more often just with the 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 learning technical component of, of swimming especially if we've not got a swimming background it's just accelerated if we can get in the water more often per week even if that's short you know uh depending on how much swimming somebody's done but but even jumping in the pool for 15 or 20 minutes on another day tacked on to a biker run uh for time efficiency can just make such a difference in the motor learning and skill acquisition for for new swimmers or or what anyone who's trying to improve obviously that the, the big benefits of that probably you know start to diminish maybe after four times a week but but uh, for for those that are under adding another swim can, can make a big difference uh, probably no matter what you're doing in the water just being in the water can 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 help a tremendous amount bike yeah um i always think about um how our training is in different locations and um this isn't one necessarily that that uh, that is possible for everyone but where there are hills available 
around their environment, then I think using using that as part of your your training uh, is just is just such a powerful thing to to do. Um, I always find you know when we when we go to the mountains to train to to Farmer or, or any altitude venue that's typically hilly, we get so much from just the general volume of climbing meters that increases you know without without even intentionally doing more um more specific sessions you know you don't need to do in fact we often do less when we go to to altitude or we go to a mountainous place but i mean this could apply for a training camp or if you have a choice of uh training uh, venues and and there's some that include more heels then uh, <laughs> encourage that choice and i suppose for people that that that's not necessarily possible. A theme that I've been just thinking about is is ensuring that um, the position we're riding in, you know, that we're not up on the on the hoods all the time. If we're in, you know, being in the aero position and producing power in the aero position is often a um, a gap for for people that you know we inevitably see post race people with um, sore backs or tight hamstrings that that under race conditions you know, have had a limitation in their ability to hold the position or it's impacted them on the run later. So I think, um, you know, that that's another one that comes to mind. And, and even even in um, World Triathlon, we, we practice riding. We, there's no more aero bars in World Triathlon, but we practice riding with the elbows down and in the drops and just closing up that hip angle because we, we know that those are the conditions that, um, at least when we're in the wind, that we, that we want to be able to produce power under. And it takes practice and it's maybe obvious in, in more long distance racing but but i certainly see a lot of people cruising around um or, or just riding easy in in their opposition and um you know that that becomes a limitation for some uh on on the run it, it's a similar similar theme is using the terrain but um but but heels as a technical tool um i come back to you know if you've got everybody's got an overpass over a motorway or, or something that they can hopefully find a hill or or even a treadmill uh, and and just being aware of posterior chain and pushing up the hill is a useful technical tool that translates to flat running as well. Um, so it, it's it's their basic tips, but hopefully you know that's applicable to almost everybody. Those that they either choosing the terrain or being intentional about about frequency and uh, and position. Yeah, definitely a good tips. And with running, just to follow up on that. Um, do you, with using hills would you do that well uh, probably both but as part of just general runs and also specific sessions or is there like a preference for one or the other yeah both i think a, a, a hilly long run like the the classic uh, lydiard uh, hilly long run uh, uh, that that he would have described early on but uh, that can be beneficial because the ups and the downs you get of course the eccentrics when you're running down even when you're running easy uh slowly running down is still is still good so i i think you know how i think of it the first part of the the build up uh you know coming out of the off season yes keep it more flat but then gradually progress to to using hills both in general runs obviously a, a recovery run may, may be less so but you know the basic runs or long runs if we can do them in the hills but also as a specific session uh certainly before we move to sort of maybe fartlek or um or track sessions if we're doing track we, we'll start with hills start with hills as a um both a, again a technical tool but also for for power um transfer and and as as a skill i think it's it's hard to beat as a as a uh, a way to improve your your running uh, mechanics mm, yeah and the final question then can you give an example of one training or performance related uh, topic that you've been thinking about recently or trying to understand better or optimize in some way? Mm. The the thing that comes to mind um, is athletes have been keep eating for a while, um, you know, over a period of time is what the optimal training load for them may be and how that changes over time has been a, has been a theme for me i mean I, it's certainly the most acute is when i'm you know working with my squad here and we have people in different phases of their career we have people at the beginning people near the end in terms of their 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 um you know olympic cycles or just the time they've been competing and and i reflect how how what they need to improve at different times can be different and particularly athletes who uh, have been competing for a long time 
you know, I always come back to the, 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 the things that resonate with me is the amount of specific work that they need, maybe less. They have a bit more experience in that space, a bit more muscle memory, for lack of a better, better term, and um, being confident that they've built that up over time and that can apply to their performance. So I think, you know, in particular, we see this with experienced athletes that maybe have a, a, an enforced layoff due to an injury or an illness and how quickly often they come back. And often, you know, in the moment, you don't think that's going to be the case, but then you, you, you see that these athletes have had this incredible bank of experience of training uh, memory um, how quickly they can improve again so I think there's many people that will find themselves in that place where they've either taken a, a layoff due to different factors or even just reminding themselves from a confidence point of view that once you've got a lot of miles in the bank uh, kilometers in the bank that, that that that's an asset that can help your performance and help you understand what's optimal for you may, may be different than it was before. And, and certainly there's a number of athletes who have become sort of attached to what they used to do. And it can become such a, a monkey on their back in terms of performance that, um, cause that changes what you need, what, what led to success or what led to good performance earlier in your triathlon journey may, may change over time. And what most certainly does, and you don't necessarily need to do the same things or even, go the same speeds even i see att athletes attached to the speeds they went when they were younger and um and that can can become counterproductive if they start to think well i still need to do that and often in these cases you don't you don't need as much uh, stimulus as you did earlier in your career so this is something i've been thinking about and, and managing and, and it's not a it's not a specific answer but certainly is is both timely and uh, and relevant to getting the most out of who's in front of us yeah, and no, it's exactly what I was the kind of thing I was looking for with this question. So, so great answer. And uh, yeah, just to finish off, uh, where can listeners follow you? Instagram, I guess. But is there any chance of your podcast returning at any point? Definitely, it's it's on the on the list. Maybe depending when this goes out, uh, the Real Coaching Podcast may might be uh, it might be back up and published. But that that's definitely on the list. I mean, it's certainly I have missed speaking about both what I'm doing and, and just reflecting. I mean, there's there's no better opportunity to uh, for, formulate your own thoughts and learning than either speaking about it or writing about it. So that's definitely on the way back. And I guess, yeah, now I'm, I'm back in this space of um, doing some personal coaching, growing the squad. Uh, I've got some camps planned for next year that anyone can attend. And it's going to be in... in um, uh, end of a end of April, May, and June next year, we've got a lovely chateau in France that we'll be doing some caps from. Where we can do the sort of the JFT stuff that uh, we do with the elites uh, in that environment. So that's new. I haven't done that in a long time. So it, it is really exciting to kind of come back into this space. Uh, I've been pretty quiet probably the last couple of years uh, for for different reasons. So I think um, yeah, just just sharing more and interacting more with the triathlon community is uh, i'm looking really looking forward to that website joefilial.com and the rest you can you can go from there um i have published a, a few short ebooks that people might be interested if they want to see some of the templates we've used in the past uh they're basic but it supports me to do more stuff like that so if you want to if you want to go to to my website you can you can see that you can get a, some perspective some uh, on how uh, we've talked about here but in going into a little bit more detail first for some of the elites and development we've done yeah well thank you so much for taking the time to come on here and uh, i guess i return to sharing uh, sharing some things and hopefully we'll hear more about that uh, on your own podcast and other platforms so yeah once again really appreciate joel and uh, good luck with the rest of the season Thanks for having me back. Great to be with you. I hope that you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com where I'll link to Joel's uh, social media and website and, of course, his past appearance on the podcast, which, as I mentioned, was in episode 172 and the more recent interview that I did with Vasco Vilasa in episode 401 where he goes through things like yeah, the training principles, that uh, how he perceives them as a member of the squad and, and also uh, going through a typical training week in great detail and all sorts of things. So that one is also highly relevant to this episode. 
next Monday, uh, Kerry McGauley is back with part two of that two-part interview. And uh, in that part, we focus on the female athlete. So we cover topics like uh, the menstrual cycle, menstrual health, literacy, coach athlete communication uh, and uh, we cover mother athlete challenges and uh, a lot more so it's a really important and really interesting episode in an area where Kerry has done a lot of research so uh, yeah hopefully you will uh, tune in for that one as well and uh, I want to once again remind you of the training camp that we have coming up in April 2024 in Mallorca and uh, I'm just going to list a few quick reasons why you might want to consider joining. First, the cycling in Mallorca is amazing. Second, it's super fun and beneficial to your fitness level to be training full-time for a week and just focus on your training and on eating and sleeping and relaxing. Uh, that's how you get really fit and strong. Uh, three, the social aspects of a camp like this are, are amazing. Our camp is unique in that there are not a lot of camps that get people from so many different corners of the world to the same place to train together and socialize together around meals and so on and that's something that has been hugely successful in the last couple of years for if you're self-coached the opportunity to chat with and learn from professional coaches is very valuable uh, not to mention uh, getting to meet up with other athletes and hear about their experiences which is also a really educational uh, experience and five the hotel is super nice uh, to relax at by the pool or in the spa or on the terraces after a great day of training and the afternoon pasta buffet is always a treat after those long rides if you're interested check out the web page for the camp on scientific triathlon.com forward slash mallorca and follow the instructions there to register or email me directly on michael at scientific triathlon.com Finally, big thanks to our sponsors, Precision Fuel and Hydration, that you can find on precisionfuelandhydration.com. If you're looking for electrolytes or fueling products, I would highly recommend trying them out. You can use their free fuel and hydration planner or even get a free video consultation with a team to prepare your race strategy. And don't forget to take 15% off your first order with the code TTS23. And thank you to Zen8. Use the Zen8 swim training to improve your technique, power, and swim training consistency. Even if you have just 15 minutes at home available, you can get a time-efficient Zen8 workout done that will help you swim better and stronger. And you can try the Senate risk free for up to 30 days and get 20% off your first order on senatesinter.com for session TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon.